Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here to try and present a, a model of trying to integrate the different kinds of treatments that we consider for helping people who have autism and other neurodevelopmental disorders. There's so much controversy in the field as parents tell me they go see one doctor who might be a traditional medical doctor who offers one set of recommendations and then they go to another doctor, perhaps a Dan doctor, who offers yet another set of recommendations. But if they tell one doctor or the other that they're going to see the other one, then that doctor says, oh, don't go see that doctor. They don't know what they're doing. So there are probably good things in all of those that we could put together to try and think about what might most help a particular child. And each child seems to respond somewhat differently and have different kinds of needs. But that integration is often difficult to do. And as Dr. Brown mentioned, I have for the last number of years gone to the Dan Doctor meetings. The Dan Doctor meeting is this week, actually, in Alexandria. And the think tank is going on, which is a smaller group of people uh, today as we are speaking. And so I didn't make it this year because I was scheduled to do this. I um, hope, really, what I do, rather than talk about one approach or the other approach, is to really try and integrate these approaches into a way that you might begin to think about what's best for your child or what approach might work the best. I um, don't know how many of you saw the advertisement in the paper for this talk that said, hope for reversing symptoms of autism. How many of you saw that? Well, I'm, I'm glad it's not everybody that's here because that was an ambitious talk and I uh, think that what happened was there was a title for this talk, which was this one that was given to me in a way that seemed reasonable. But in the paragraph describing it, there was saying that I think that many of these new models, these new way of understanding, do offer us hope for someday beginning to reverse these symptoms or intervening early enough or doing uh, interventions that are more meaningful than, than the ones that we do now, which sometimes are more palliative. And that's what I'm going to talk about tonight, is some of the hope and some of the research that we're doing. And there'll be an adequate amount of time at the end where I hope that we can all uh, discuss issues or cases or ideas that you have about things that might be helpful. You know, to, to just kind of think about the way models have evolved over time, I can't say that I'm proud of the first one, at least when it comes to autism. I th although I think there is some value in this psychodynamic approach, but the psychodynamic and psychoanalytic approach approached autism all wrong. It looked at a dyadic relationship as though it was going uh, only one way and made a terrible mistake about what they thought was actually causing autism, which they said was cold and rejecting mothers that were uh, then feared by their infants who pulled away and then pulled away from uh, their interaction with others and a thing that I think was a sad state of affairs. The thing that really began to change that, though, were behavioral treatments that were done first by Lovas, who spoke here, and many of you are familiar with his work doing ABA, saying that behavioral interventions could make a difference in the way that children with autism functioned, that it could actually show that there was some statistical, statistically significant difference in the way that they could do after targeted behavioral interventions. And I think it changed the way we began to think about autism, in part as a psychodynamic disorder, but in part as a disorder that was hopeless or that didn't have much opportunity to change. It gave us the idea that we could reverse, to some extent, the symptoms of autism. Then we kind of have a DSM-based diagnostic model that talked about pervasive developmental disorder, NOS, or Asperger's disorder, or autism, that I think is trying its best to find a nomenclature that's useful, but probably won't be useful to us as much in the future as we begin to understand better subtypes in autism and better understand the different pathways that lead to what might look like a common disorder, autism, at the end. Pharmacologic and medical interventions have also come along, thinking about medications that might be helpful in redu reducing associated symptoms associated with autism. But 
that's really what they're doing, and for the most part, is treating symptoms associated with autism. But few of them, at least up until recently, have really been able to reverse the, the core symptoms of autism. One of the people that I think a lot of is Bernie Remlin, who I think did a lot to reverse that first misconception, the psychodynamic misconception, when he wrote a book in the 60s talking about how autism was really a, a biomedical disorder, a neurologic disorder, not a disorder in a relationship. He did a second thing, though, that I think was really important, and that was to say there are bi biomedical underpinnings of autism, that there are ways that we could identify these biomedical pathways and then begin to make interventions that could alter the course or the trajectory of the disorder. And he founded Dan, along with John Pangborn and, uh, and then a number of other people. And I think some of their science is still waiting for good studies to come along and show how they work, and we'll review some of that. But it changed a model from one that was psychodynamic to strictly behavioral to one that we could think of as perhaps even a whole body disorder, a biomedical disorder. And for that word not totally being adequate either, I think people have tried to talk about integrative medicine or functional medicine that pulls together all of these approaches. I'm not sure that that term is totally satisfying to me either. And increasingly, I'm thinking about a term, translational research, and I'm going to define that as we go through the talk tonight. So I'll talk about some of those approaches. I'll talk in the end about what I think might be an integrative model for all of us to think about how we approach someone with autism and how to help them. And then talk about the direction that the Mind Institute is going in terms of trying to help flesh this out to understand it better. So as you know, in the medical profession, and I think in other healthcare professions, and in science and academia, we base a lot of what we think is really true on what we call evidence-based medicine. We say, what's been published in the literature for peer review? What things have double-blind, placebo-controlled studies where we can separate out those differences? And double-blind, placebo-controlled studies are ones that help control for other factors that might be taken into account. For instance, we did a study here a few years ago of Lexapro, an antidepressant treating pediatric depression in children. And it was part of a multi-site study. And over 60% of the children responded. That's pretty good if you can find a medication that gets a 60-some percent response rate for treating that disorder. But over 40% of those in the placebo group also responded. So when the makers of Lexapro took that to the Federal Drug Administration and said, we'd like an indication for this medication to treat pediatric depression, the FDA said, that's not enough of a separation for us to give you that indication. So it happens in those kinds of medications, but it happens as well in parents that have a, a more long-term disorder in their children, and they want so badly to see them do well that they might rate people even in a placebo group as doing better, and we'll talk about some of our placebo-controlled trials that indeed do show a pretty high placebo response rate. But it calls into question many treatments that have passionate people who say, this really is making a big difference for my child. But you say, compared to what? Or how do you know that this isn't some kind of a placebo effect? So we'll talk about that in some of the studies that we review and some of the studies that we're doing here. But in the autism literature, if we were to say, where are the best studies? Where are the ones that have the studies published in peer review literature that have some double-blind placebo-controlled trials. I'm going to go through about five slides that go from the most evidence to the least and then talk about anecdotal evidence, which is still evidence. People saying, this really worked for my child, but not in a placebo condition, not in a study condition. So one still has to take that with a grain of salt. But when I go to Dan Think Tanks, most of what they describe is anecdotal evidence for the kinds of treatments that they're doing. And I think it's exciting that they're trying new things and things that work, but they're not yet doing the kinds of studies that help us really know what works. So the most evidence is for ABA, followed by TEACH, PRT, 
floor time, those kinds of treatments are published where people can review them. People use them with a fair amount of training. There's some fidelity to the way that people deliver those kinds of care to others. So if we were to say, where is there the most evidence? It's on this slide. Then we move along to things like speech and language therapy, picture exchange communication, communication books, augmentative communication devices, increasingly are being studied and researched and found to be helpful. Then certain medications, atypical antipsychotics. As you know, Risperdal has three double-blind placebo-controlled trials and got the FDA to approve it for an indication of treating irritability along with autism. SSRIs, there's probably 40 or 50 published studies of SSRIs in treating people with autism. Melatonin for sleep is, has, has a number of studies that are helpful. And other medications and nutritional supplements are increasingly being studied and published where we have some evidence, some way to review that they're helpful. Linda Mood Bell has some published studies, not so much for autism, but some for autism and, and some for other kinds of learning disorders. Even daily life therapy has published studies showing that it's of some benefit. Further down the list are things like computer pro programs. Fast forward has been suggested as being helpful for disorders like autism, but when you talk to people that really use it, they say it's helpful for dyslexia, but not so much for autism. Aerobics, training auditory attention, train time where the train moves around the track and you pay attention to where it's going and you get certain rewards or ways that you interact because of the fascination of the train and it's moving around. All ways to try and work with a child with autism's unique abilities to attend, but using things that help improve their ability to communicate. Then we're into the anecdotal kinds of, of interventions, some that might hold promise but there aren't really any good double-blind, placebo-controlled, or peer-reviewed studies showing their benefit. So the Tomatis method was a study now that has two published papers, one positive and one negative, about the Tomatis method being of some benefit. A number of these others have no real published papers showing their benefit, but there are avid folks who say, this really has made a big difference for my child, or therapists who say, this makes a big difference for the children that I work with. Things like the Domain Delcato method, which is a kind of patterning kind of thing, again has no evidence that it works, but it has adherents that say that it makes a big difference. Craniosacral therapy also has people that say that it works, again, no good studies, although we have been approached to do a study here and we're considering it. Hyperbaric oxygen has one small studies with a series of three cases showing that it might be a benefit to children with autism. Still no large study done at this time, although there are studies being done, one by Dan Rosignol at uh, Thoughtful House. We've submitted an IRB to do an, uh, an HBOT study here at the Mind Institute as well. And I'll tell you a little more about that as we go on through and what our rationale for doing that. EEG biofeedback's been suggested, but again, no studies to show that it's really a benefit. So I'm going to shift into another segment for just a few minutes and talk again about the biomedical approach. The biomedical approach in some ways is taking a whole different stand about this disorder, a disorder that we've thought many times we characterize by external behaviors and external symptoms. They're saying, in a sense, we've thought of autism as a disease that affects the brain. We're thinking about neurotransmitters and brain regions. Whereas they're saying, in a certain way, autism is a disease that affects the whole body. And they're saying we know that when we see these children have bad GI symptoms, or when they have seizure disorders, or when they develop regressive autism, which we know occurs in about 30% of people with autism. Something happens that triggers this kind of second wave of changes and suggests that it's not just a brain disorder or an external symptom disorder, Rather, it's something that might be affecting the whole body. And so they've come up with a number of treatments that, as John suggested, are sometimes called complementary and alternative, but they would call biomedical, even though I think we could use biomedical in a broader kind of sense. Some of those biomedical treatments are aimed at neurotransmitter function 
and, and production and release. Things like B6 and magnesium, omega-3, St. John wort. Food sensitivities and gastrointestinal function, things like the gluten-free, casein-free diet, secretin, digestive enzymes, antibiotics, and we're gonna talk a little more about these as we go on through the talk, not in great detail, but if in the end in the discussion you wanna ask more particularly about any one of these, we can discuss them here, but I'll also give you references where you can learn more about those. Others are focused on an immune mechanism or some modulation of that immune mechanism, looking at antifungals, IV, Ig, vitamin A and cod liver oil, Sometimes they might focus on heavy metal toxin removing, feeling that the removal, feeling that the toxin load is too heavy. So doing chelation could be helpful in removing those toxins. Methylation, a part of a cycle that we'll talk a little more about in a few minutes, that's part of the way our body handles oxidative stress and may even handle toxic load as well. They say might be helped by methylcobalamin or folinic acid. And I say they, I don't know whether to say they or we, because I, I think that there's some merit in what's being said, but until we have the good science to back something up, it's hard to really say this totally you know, works or that this makes fully, fully makes sense. And then there are non-biologic approaches like craniosacral manipulation or even transcranial magnetic stimulation or yet another approach of kind of biomedical or CAM type treatments. What I'd like to do now, though, is talk a little bit about leading into another model, and a model that I think makes some sense about how we can begin to think about interventions and why they might work. I was really pleased that the founding parents of the MIND Institute named it the MIND Institute, Medical Investigation of Neurodevelopmental Disorders. It says in that title that we're focused on a process, neurodevelopment, not a diagnosis, autism or Tourette's or Fragile X, but on a process that we hope that we can find the trajectory where we can make an intervention that makes a difference in how a child develops. That trajectory starts at one end with our genes and with the intrauterine environment, the bath water that the baby's brain grows in, in a sense. That bath water can have a number of contaminants, viruses, uh, cigarette uh, toxins, uh, alcohol, toxins from the environment of a whole variety of kind that can affect then that growing baby's brain. And then it kind of I tried to show in a sense by these little filter colors that, that it goes through a whole series of processes that are part of where we can begin to think about this trajectory of how neurodevelopment happens. The brain starts out as two little cells, one little cell that divide, forms two, forms a flat plate, folds in on itself to form the neural tube. That neural tube then begins to differentiate into the parts of our brain from the back to the forward part. And that whole process happens over a period of days and weeks and months that can be affected by things like genetics, but also like that intrauterine environment that's happening at that time that affects the way that brain is growing. There are brain regions that come online early, like the back part, our brain stem, or the cerebellum, and there are parts that come more online later, like our frontal lobes. And those things that affect brain growth early affect brain growth downstream in ways that don't look the same as if you just had a hit downstream. So it gets fairly complicated as we think about all the factors, but you can recognize a process going on. Developmental processes like pruning, where those synapses, we start off with many more synapses than we wind up with. And those that are used the most grow in a healthy way, like a tree that didn't get pruned. And those that don't get used as much get pruned and don't get used. There may be things in the environment, though, that cause our bodies, or our brains, to not prune adequately or to prune too much that can affect the way the brain is growing or a process called myelination, where a protective sheath or coating forms on the outside of a nerve or forms in our brain and becomes what we call our white matter. It's the connectivity of the brain that happens really from birth all the way into our 20s, a process that's ongoing and can therefore be influenced by things that happen to it even later. The same is so for things like temperament, 
we start off at the time of birth with a distinct temperament that can be identified. Our activity level, our approach avoidance, our way of interacting with the environment. And the environment can help shape that to some extent, although the opening stanza, so to speak, of our life often remains very profound. I sometimes try and tell our child psychiatry residents or fellows that are listening to the story of somebody's life that it's a little like listening to a Bach fugue or a Beethoven symphony. You can listen to the opening stanzas and know a lot about what the rest of the themes might be throughout the life. So if it's da 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 da, then you go da 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 da, and so on. Or if you're listening to a Bach fugue, it's much more difficult to pick out those things, but they're there at the beginning and they may change and move around, but they're there as something that we can listen to and hear in various ways and perhaps do things to alter or change. And then we come out and are influenced by our postnatal environment to move in healthy or not so healthy ways. This neurodevelopmental model has become possible for us to start to understand it because of new technology, MRIs and all the different kinds of MRIs, molecular genetics, immunology, all these factors that play a role in the way the brain develops, we can now study in the living brain without waiting for somebody to die so that we can section up their brain or without having to do a brain biopsy or even without having to use radioisotopes or x-rays that could damage the growing brain. We can see the way it's developing and we've learned that brain growth is plastic. We can change the way the brain is growing, not profoundly, but in some ways that can help it grow in a healthy way or in a not so healthy way. We also know that it's cyclical, that there are certain key periods in growth and development where we can influence the way the brain grows in a healthy way or in a not so healthy way, but there are those key times where it's especially important when we make an intervention. And we know brain growth is influenced by our interaction with the environment, suggesting that we have the opportunity to not only have that brain grow in a not so healthy way, but to help the brain grow in a more healthy way. If we can identify these factors early in the trajectory, then we can do things like improving the environmental interaction, that we can enhance developmental projection, pro progression. We can do things like helping to prevent things like what we call kindling, where the, sometimes if you have somebody that is having a, an emotional meltdown, there are some studies that would suggest the more of those you have, the more likely you are to have more of those. So if we can intervene in a way that stops those, particularly in disorders like bipolar disorder, that we can alter the course of the disorder. It hasn't been shown yet in autism, although we know children with autism can have meltdowns. We also know that there's something called sensitization, where these repeated episodes can begin to become part of the epigenetics of our body, a way that we continue to keep those things going at a translational, deeper kind of level than is just there on the surface. So if we can protect through those high-risk periods, we can do things to promote or create healthy development. So that leads us to what I'm going to now kind of define a bit when I talked about translational research. What happens in that? And what relevance does that have for the MIND Institute? What I think is really the next big step where medicine's going and the next big step of what we can do with autism is to think about translational research, where those things that we learn from the bench, from the basic science research, that tell us something about models for disorders, can then be applied into the way that we treat patients. So bench to bedside. But the other part of that is bedside back to bench. So we have a number of meetings here at the MIND Institute that we call translational research meetings, where we're trying to think about what kinds of symptoms are we seeing in the clinic that might be relevant to the kinds of things that the basic scientists are seeing in the lab. And you've heard some, and you'll hear more at the next talk, about our Autism Phenome Project, an effort to really create a subtype or subtypes of autism that helps us know better about the pathways that led to those kids having autism in the first place. So that when we make an intervention, of a child that has been well phenotyped and they get better with an intervention like methyl B12 or even Risperdal, we can go back and say, what was unique about that child 
that helped us know better why they responded well and tells us something more about the unique type of autism that they have. So it's bench to bedside and bedside back to bench. The, the UC Davis was one of 12 centers nationally that received a large, huge five-year grants to use translational research to improve medicine. So UC Davis is well situated for that, but the Mind Institute is well situated where we have 30,000 square feet of wet lab space next to us doing basic science research, and we have 16 exam rooms with people doing clinic, regular clinic visits, but also doing our research clinic where we can really find a way to think more carefully about these, and I'm gonna tell you a little more about that. First though, let me tell you a little about, in a simplistic way, what we might say causes autism. The truth is, we don't know what causes autism, but if we were to talk in kind of broad generalities, we'd say that first, there's kind of a genetic neurodevelopmental vulnerability. It may be hardwired in our most basic part of our genes, or it may be in those expressions of genes that might be influenced by even the environment, part of what we call epigenetics, that, that next layer out. But there's something neurodevelopmentally programmed in that creates a vulnerability. And that vulnerability then reacts to that second hit, so to speak, the environmental stressor and the interaction between those two. That might be something toxic in the environment, it might be just some other trigger that hits a person at a particularly vulnerable time that creates that second reaction and leads then into the third hit, which is where there's restricted development that comes as a result of the autism. When we had that first model, the psychodynamic model, people that were probably well-intentioned but were doing a great deal of damage said to parents, you know, there's not much hope for your child. Find a place, for an institution for them put them away someplace because they're not going to make any great progress. And sure enough, they didn't because they were put into these institutions where they learned not really what they could learn from typically developing peers or from programs that were individually designed for them, but instead they were with a whole bunch of other children that were also impaired. And so then the third hit came, this additional restricted development that made autism seem as though it was a hopeless disorder, whereas increasingly, we're beginning to say that there is some hope for autism and what pe some people are referring to as recovery. A kind of double-edged sword where on the one hand you'd say recovery, that's hopeful. And on the other hand, for parents who don't have children that recover, you then say, what did I do wrong? Why didn't that happen to my child or to me? I did everything that I could think of to try and have them do better. Could they really have recovered? Could they really have made a difference? And I would have to tell you that I know lots and lots of parents that have tried absolutely every treatment that's available, including the most radical DAN treatments and all kinds of other treatments, and their children have not recovered. So I think that there are some that do better, and some that do a lot better, and some that do a little bit better. But I think there is hope that if we could just better match treatments to particular children, we might be able to do a better job of making these children's trajectory come out a lot better in the end. Well, at the Mind Institute, the first study that gave us some real hope that this might make a difference was what was referred to as our neonatal blood spot study. It was the, the study that really put the Mind Institute on the map. Published in 2001, we moved into this building in 2003, so it was before we were even here. And it was a study that was done on cord blood from infants born in California. And when infants are first born, they have this blood from their umbilical cord that's put on a little blotter and put into a file where their birth record is kept. And in this study, they went and looked at children when they were older and had developed disorders and looked at children who developed autism or mental retardation or cerebral palsy or children that were typically developing. And they found with a high degree of reliability that they could identify those children who developed either autism or mental retardation. They couldn't separate those two, and it may be that they had both, but they could separate that group from the group that had cerebral palsy and separate all of those from the group that was typically developing. And it gave, gave real hope to the idea that perhaps we could develop a biomarker that's present at the time of birth that could identify risk 
and help us know that we could make some kind of an intervention to alter the course of what that risk is. We've been looking hard for it ever since, as has everybody else. But we're beginning to make some progress, and I'll tell you about some of that. That blood spot study led to what was called the Center for Children's Environmental Health. That was a center that focused on environmental genetic interactions, led by Isaac Pesa and Urza hertz Pachoto, looking at the, a number of things in the environment, including vaccines, thiomerosol, methylmercury, PCBs, pesticides, industrial byproducts, a huge host of things that are in our environment that we don't know what effect they have on the developing nervous system. And there's beginning to be results released from that study, and I'll tell you about a couple tonight. But they're beginning to help us identify certain toxins that aren't good for growing the nervous system and the brain of people. And they're also beginning to identify particular genetic patterns that might be this interaction that we talked about. They went into what was called the CHARGE study, the Childhood Autism Risks from Genetics in the Environment, that will evaluate 700 families with autism, 600 with developmental disabilities, and 700 from the general population. And some of those results are just beginning to be released as well. And I'll tell you about some of those tonight as well. Some of them not yet published, but some of them at least peer-reviewed enough that we can share them with you here tonight that sh show that there's some promise from this study in be beginning to identify this kind of an interaction. So some of those are that there seems to be reduced levels of immunoglobulin in children with autism, which correlates with behavioral symptoms. A study out of Judy Vanderwater's group, along with a number of other names that you'll hear me mention here tonight, Paul Ashwood and others, that say these reduced level of immunoglobulins, which are found variably reduced in children with autism, if they looked at those, whether those related to behavioral symptoms in children, there was a high degree of correlation. There was an increased prevalence of maternal autoantibodies against fetal brain and autism. It doesn't mean directly fetal brain, it means fetal brain protein, but it's a kind of antigen that suggests that perhaps mothers, and I hate the way this study has come out a little bit, but mothers might unwittingly be passing on an autoantibody to their child, perhaps from their own immune system that had been taxed or has been somehow uniquely marked, and then passed on to their child, making them more vulnerable to that second hit that we talked about earlier, making them have some kind of vulnerability, although certainly they didn't know that. But if we could find those kinds of things were true, just like those blood spot studies, we could do things like even immunophoresis or other ways to cleanse the blood of the mothers that wouldn't then pass on those autoantibodies. And so the direction of our research is going in that way. We've also learned that children with autism have distinctive cytokine and chemokine profiles. Those are measures of inflammation, saying there's something inflammatory, perhaps, going on in at least some of these children with autism. And we're not the only center to be reporting that. Kennedy Krieger at Johns Hopkins are reporting those kinds of findings as well, as are some other centers. I had mentioned that Isaac Pess's group had talked about some kind of um, studies that are beginning to show the particular vulnerability to environmental toxins. And Isaac and his group found that dendritic cells, part of our immune system, tend to be particularly sensitive to thiomerosol, more than we ever thought possible, more than is previously, or is currently reported as being safe. And then some other studies, which come, uh, uh, the title, Natural Killer Cells, Viruses, and Autism, come from studies of these genomic microarrays from Frank Sharp's group that shows a difference here, looking at children with regressed autism and children with non-regressed autism in the genomic profiles, suggesting that the killer T cells, one of our body's ways of fighting infection, are altered in that group with regressed autism and different in the group with the non-regressed. There are also changes in the beta cells, another cell that seems to show response to a kind of invading organism that one's trying to fend off. Again, suggesting that there might be some immune or some inflammatory process that might be playing a role in autism. There have been other studies that have come out as well, one looking at elevated leptin levels. 
Leptins is kind of fat, a lipid. It's kind of interesting to think that that would be elevated in autism, except there is a body of research indicating that perhaps there are altered lipid levels in people with autism. And that might lead in to thinking about altered free fatty acid function in people with autism. A proteomic study from Blythe Corbett and a group of people here found that indeed these children did show a differential expression of apolipoproteins and complement proteins, again looking at fatty acid metabolism in those children that had autism. And again from Isaac Pesce's group, or from a group that he's part of, there's a study that will be released in any week now, in the next week or two, showing that exposure to PCBs alters the plasticity in the rat's primary auditory cortex. And in the discussion of this paper, Isaac and the authors talk about how we see that children with autism sometimes have a unique way of processing auditory input. They don't seem, their hearing is okay, but they don't seem to fully understand what's coming in as though they miss some of the words or they miss some of what's coming in. And he wonders, could piece, these PCBs that show alterations in the rat's auditory cortex, could that also be something that we might see as responsible for autism in children? It's a speculation, but again, something that he's looking at. And then we have a whole series of studies from Sally Rogers, Sally Ozanoff, in a group that you've seen on 60 Minutes and have seen some good reports recently from talking about the early identification and then the opportunity for early intervention in children with autism. A study that was reported recently talking about how year old babies were less likely to respond to their name if they were those children that went on to develop autism. Wondering is the response to the name an early marker for at least making a, a more careful assessment of whether autism might be present. Another study from the same group showing that infants with diminished gaze to their mother's eyes relative to her mouth also were more likely to have an older sibling with autism. Again, suggesting maybe that's a marker that might be useful to say, let's make an intervention earlier. Now, Dr. Sally Rogers, who spoke at the first one of these uh, minds at the mind, talked some, I think, about mirror neurons. And she has a great deal of interest of how mirror neurons might have some role in imitation and in a way that children with autism may not be as well equipped to learn from that imitating response. And based on this, plus a lot of her work, she and Lori Vismara have been doing some very interesting studies that Autism Speaks has funded them to do even more of about working with intervention as early as a year working to help train parents to be the interveners, having them learn how to make these interventions with children that can make that very early and hopefully effective kind of change in how children are growing and developing. The idea being not just that we're taking this disorder after it's developed and trying to backstep, but we're trying to get this disorder in its trajectory early before it's fully developed and then have it backstep. And even in that way, thinking of it not as just a behavioral thing, but as a biomedical thing as well. Because whatever is being reversed is being recorded in the brain and the way the brain works, perhaps through imitation in mere neurons, perhaps through the amygdala and other circuits that are involved that we're learning more about. But giving us hope and a way of better understanding what might be causing autism and how we can intervene early and effectively. All of this begins us to have us make a kind of paradigm shift, if you will, a different way of looking at autism. It was kind of, I, I alluded to it a little bit when I mentioned something before about the biomedical treatment saying, is autism a disorder of the brain or is it a disorder of the body's metabolism that affects the brain? But it begins to create a shift where we talk about autism not by its end symptoms, not by those repetitive stereotype movements or the lack of eye contact, but instead by looking and beginning to think of it as what's the underlying process that might be accounting for this? How can we think of this in a translational way that'll help us look at the trajectory and intervene at a different place and maybe even in a different way? So based on what I've gone through tonight, 
just those research, the, the research that we've done here at the Mind Institute and have been corroborated by other research centers, we or I have kind of divided it up into at least five different areas. So there's immune function. Could we do things to strengthen immune function that would improve outcome? Oxidative stress, the way the body handles toxic burden, the way it handles stress and that load. Is there something we could do to improve the body's handling oxidative stress? What about inflammatory processes? Are there things that we could do to reverse inflammatory processes, particularly in people that are vulnerable? Are there things in nutrition that could help the body be healthier and work better, especially even as we're thinking about GI function that might not be working so well? And then can we think about early targeted behavioral intervention? So based on those, I'm going to tell you about some of the studies we're doing in each of those areas to try and take that different way of thinking and say, does it work? Now, the paper overpromised what I might be able to say because I don't think that at this point I have anything to tell you that we can do that's going to reverse the symptoms of autism. Although we are seeing some children that respond remarkably well, and I'll tell you about those, but not all children do. So we still have a long way to go to try and say, how could we subtype these children with our APP to know which children respond to which, tre which treatment to then be able to better tailor our treatments for autisms rather than one single autism. So in immunology, we did a study here done by Dr. Robin Hansen looking at oral IgG, an oral anti-inflammatory or immune type system type thing given to kids that have GI problems taking this oral IgG. Some people would say oral IgG isn't great, you need to do the IV or you need to do the, some other mechanism which is very expensive and, and somewhat dangerous and not one that's proven to be very effective either. But oral IgG in this large multi-site study didn't turn, to be, turn out to be effective for children with autism and GI symptoms. Maybe they could analyze the data and look at those kids that had a particular profile, but none of those kids were profiled to begin with that would help us know which children might have done better, which ones were outliers. And Robin, who I saw earlier and, and I think is here, might be able to comment later on whether there seemed to be outliers that would suggest some children did remarkably well, but I don't think so. There's a medication called Actos that's uh, used to treat type 2 diabetes. A Dan doctor, Marvin Boris in Long Island, reported a study of well over 50 children that he treated with Actos, looking at their immune functioning using a, a cytokine biomarker that was done in the lab of, of Doug Feinstein in Chicago, showing that these children ahead of time had high cytokines showing inflammation. And after the Actos treatment, their, their, their cytokines dropped or tended to normalize, and in many of them, their symptoms improved. So we've all talked together about saying, let's do a study of Actos. Let's see if it works. And we went, to the FD, we went to our IRB, we turned in an IRB, to, they're the people that give us consent to do these things with human subjects, and they said, um, well, you need to get an investigational new drug approval from the FDA. They need to approve this. So we went to the FDA, and the FDA said, well, Takeda, the manufacturers of this drug, need to give us all of their data on using Actos, and, and then we'll consider, in children, and we'll consider giving you that IND. And Takeda, who's having a field day doing studies right now in multiple sclerosis and finding some benefits, said, you know, we're really not interested in doing another study. So they didn't give the data, so we didn't get the IND, so we didn't get the IRB approval. But Doug Feinstein, who's doing research with MS, has gone back to Takeda now, and we're hopeful that maybe someday we will be able to do a study of this unique treatment that might help us alter immune function. Oxidative stress, and I'll tell you more about our methyl B12 study. We finished about 20 subjects at this point. We're at, we have 24 that are in, this, in the study, um, and we have some preliminary results that we'll share with you. Because we thought, let's look at oxidative stress and see what can be done with that. Inflammation, we thought, what could we do to reduce inflammation? Well, as you know, or you might know, hyperbaric oxygen works very well for wound healing. It helps when people have had surgery, it helps for people that have broken bones. It helps with people that have had traumatic brain injuries. In a sense, heal that traumatic injury and may help improve circulation, 
may do a number of other things. And there are a large number of parents, some of you here tonight that I've talked to, that say, I'd love to have my child get HBOT. And when they go find out about getting HBOT, they find that to go in a hard shell chamber, it can cost $96,000 for the 80 dives that it might take to get that, that full treatment. Or it might cost $30,000 for the soft shell. Or you could buy a soft shell for your home, but there's not, it's not clear, does one work better than the other? Does a higher oxygen, a higher pressure work better? So we designed a study with the, our, our HBOT center here on Stockton Boulevard to try and look at HBOT to see does it really help children with autism. And it's been reviewed by the IRB that wants to talk to us before we go ahead and do that study, but we are going to talk with them and in that way want to find out whether it helps. You know, I might have started the talk by saying this, but I'll say it now. I think our founding parents, and many of you I consider part of our founding families, have said to us, we want you at the Mind Institute to leave no stone unturned about what might help with autism. We want you to do good science. We don't want you to do sloppy science. We want you to do good science and help us know what works, but we want you to keep an open mind. We want you to, and, and that's why I feel like I can go to the Dan meeting and my colleagues say, oh, don't go to the Dan meeting. They'll be, you'll be labeled one of those weirdo guys, you know, that do this Dan treatment. I kind of like the Dan doctors, I have to tell you, and I respect them, but I feel I can go there and say, you know, our parents told me I should keep an open mind and I should, you know, try and learn all I can about what might help autism. And so some of these studies, I find some people roll their eyes like, why are you doing those studies? And I think there's a good rationale for it. I think it might be helping kids with autism. If it doesn't, parents can make an informed decision. But if it does, we've learned a lot. So we've also been interested in omega-3 fatty acids. Again, looking at that lipid metabolism that we talked about before that we seem to show a little bit of abnormality in. And I told you that we have these translational research meetings. And we had, uh, we've been having them monthly, but last week we had an extra one to focus on omega-3 fatty acids. And it was so exciting. We had basic scientists that are studying lipid metabolism. We had a person who does rat research or mice, mice research with uh, lipids and omega-3s. We have a man that's out in private business that's an MD, PhD, looking at omega-3s and the role that they might have. They're, we connected to a lab in, in Minnesota that is doing some really kind of specialized studies that I think might really help us learn a great deal about this. And some of you might have seen a report from George Lambert's lab in New Jersey saying they found a, a treatment that really makes a difference for autism. And it appears that it's based on fatty acid metabolism. And so I think there may be something there for particular children. And we have a grant being reviewed right now to look at omega-3s and see what difference it makes. We're looking, obviously, at behavioral treatments. Sally Rogers is looking at mirror neurons, looking at the effects of early interventions. And in all of these studies, what's really key is to have some kind of biomarker, something that we can look at before that could be changed later. So we're looking at pharmacogenetics and genomics, and I'll tell you a little more about a study that's being reviewed right now for funding. We're also looking at cytokines, and we're beginning to look at MRI kinds of measures that would show change as well. So our methyl B12 study, let me, you all have been good. I've been going for 50 minutes and I haven't seen anybody fall asleep or give a big yawn. Is this pace okay with everybody? Is it too fast or too slow? Or it seems like you're staying with me and I'm gonna be through in about 10, 15 minutes and then we'll open it up for questions for the rest of the time. Methylcobalamin, we had a study here. We had a meeting here about two years ago where we invited in a number of Dan doctors and complementary alternative doctors. Michael Chez, who's a pediatric neurologist here at Sutter right now, came to that meeting for the first time. Rick Rollins was helpful in picking the guest list who we ought to include. We had about 20 people and we sat in this room around a table and we reviewed 15 Dan type treatments. And I said to them, you know, what we'd like to do is find a study that lends itself to a double blind placebo control condition and is one that we're likely to get a positive result, so we'll keep on with this. So people wanted us to do chelation. Chelation is really hard to do in a double-blind kind of study because the pr true practitioners say you should first have a child on a casein gluten-free diet, 
then you have to supplement with different minerals and metals that you're pulling out with a chelator. So it's not really, it doesn't lend itself to do very well as a double blind study. And it's somewhat controversial. So we said, let's pass on that. But the unanimous vote for everybody was says, do methyl, methyl B12, see if that works. So we did. And it was based on this kind of model that shows how the methyl group is picked up in this B12 pathway. And it goes along through the different parts of methionine down through glutathione and a, a part of the body that helps the body handle oxidative stress, not only in autism, but in cancer and in other disorders as well. But Jill James did a study in autism where she found that the majority of her children had altered uh, glutathione or methionine pathways. And when she supplemented them with subcutaneously under the skin injected methyl B12, those values normalized. She didn't do good behavioral ratings to say how much did their symptoms improve. She just normalized their blood levels. But anecdotally, people said they improved a lot. So Jill is doing the lab values on all of our study patients that we're seeing here in the methyl B12 study. And we're doing what's called a double-blind placebo crossover trial, where people are six weeks on either the placebo or the active medication, and then they cross over and do the other. Some people criticize that kind of design because maybe the effects wash over. So if you do methyl B12 first, maybe it washes over into the placebo group. But it gives us twice the number of subjects, which allows us to get to hopefully some significance that would allow us to apply for a larger grant to do the single double-blind placebo control study. Well, in the first analysis of the first 14 subjects, or I guess that's actually 9 and 5, but where am I here? I think we have a, another one that is a little better showing the first 14, showing that the Stanford Binet nonverbal score improved in a significant amount. The verbal score did not. Several other measures did not. And in our most recent first cut at reanalysis in the 20, we didn't necessarily show significance on any of the measures, but we're reanalyzing, looking more carefully at the way that they kind of break out. What, though, was the most profound was that we found a big difference in the subject, in certain subjects. So that chart up at the top is showing there's not a big difference. There's a little difference between the, the treatment group and the placebo group. But what this, these charts down below show that for two subjects, this was when we had nine, two of them did extraordinarily well. One little boy came in and had limited language, um, was in a preschool, the same preschool he'd been in all along, getting an ABA type program. And after six weeks, and then even more after three months, the parents say he's made just remarkable gains. The school said he doesn't need to be here anymore. He's doing so well. Now maybe it was just happenstance. Maybe you know his ABA program finally kicked in. Maybe he had a spontaneous remission. Because that's only one case. And we had several others that did very well. But what we think might be happening is that there are some children that are really more likely to have this kind of an autism, that if we could identify them ahead of time, so we're now busily analyzing our data, saying if we look at these different glutathione levels, could we predict who responds really well and who doesn't, so that we don't have to put everybody through this treatment, just some people. Because some people didn't do particularly well. They didn't do poorly. Nobody did bad. A few got a little activated or active, and they chose not to continue in the study. Some of our parents came in and said, I know which arm that kid was in. I know for sure. And we'd break the blind, and sure enough, they were wrong. They thought that when he did the very best, he was on the placebo. And when he did the very worst, he was on the active medication. Some of them were absolutely right. Over half the subjects, after we broke the blind, have chosen to continue on in the continuation phase. So over half the parents thought it was making enough good for their child that it was worth continuing these every three days subcutaneous injections that seems to show some benefit for how their, how their children are doing. We have no other great kind of outcomes other than these two cases, but we have some people that are doing modestly better. We've also been doing a study trying to look at pharmacogenomics to see could these help us predict who's going to respond to a particular medication or nutritional intervention. 
Frank Sharp does these microarrays, and the first one is showing something like what I showed you earlier that showed the difference between regressive and non-regressive autism. This last one is showing a difference between children on Risperdal or not on Risperdal. And what we're hoping is that we can show a difference between those children that respond well to Risperdal and those children that don't. And we have a grant that got a fairly good score, but not enough to get funded. And we've resubmitted it, and it'll be uh, uh, reviewed this summer. And we hope, not just for Risperdal, but for lots of other treatments, that we can do a better job of identifying who's going to respond in the beginning. So I'm heading towards the closing part of my talk. And what I'd like to kind of do in this last part is say, how would all of this stuff affect the way we treat somebody? How would it affect the way you might think about treating the children that you have or the children that you work with or the children that you care about? What might you consider? Well, clearly, one should do a, an excellent medical workup. They could be, should be sure that they've considered every genetic cause that might be playing a role, even though knowing that genetic cause doesn't mean you're going to have a magic bullet kind of treatment. You at least know there's something genetic playing a role. If they have neurologic symptoms, clearly it's worth working those neurologic symptoms up. If they have GI symptoms, you hope that you find a good gastroenterologist that can help you resolve those symptoms because it appears that improving those GI symptoms improves the autism. Whether it's just that having bad GI symptoms makes everybody feel crummy, including kids with autism, or maybe it's something in an inflammatory process that's making a difference for how these children are doing. I think you might have here heard Margaret Bowman or at other places heard Margaret Bowman talk about just the importance of doing a really thoughtful, good medical evaluation. Not one that says, oh, it's just the autism, but one that says, maybe he's hitting his head because he has an inflamed ear. Or maybe he's doing this funny thing with his stomach when he walks around because he has a little bit of gastrointestinal reflux. Maybe there's some things medical that explain some of those symptoms. So let's do a good medical workup and make sure that we've really thought about all the things, especially in children that can't tell us where they hurt or can't tell us about the symptoms that they're experiencing. Then, of course, you want to think about all the ancillary kinds of treatments that you might do and benefit from, speech, OT, those other kinds of treatments, and working with the school to make sure that you have the very best intervention and families for early autism treatment, FEET, really can help you become a great advocate for your child and work with school systems to help them do the very best kind of work. One would think about behavioral treatments. It's certainly none of these treatments would suggest it's not worth also getting a good behavioral program for what your child, but hopefully you're getting it early. And you're getting one that kind of matches and develops with the child and that's not solely adult-based so that it's only the adult doing the behavioral program. But, and I learned this well from Sally Rogers, who taught me over and over again, that children can learn very much from typically developing children. And you heard her talk about that last time. And so the importance of making sure that our children, children with autism, have the opportunity to learn in typically developing settings without feeling totally out of place, as though there's nobody that they relate to except that adult that walks around with them trying to be their friendly gorilla or help them get through their program. So then you say, what could I do to treat the core symptoms? Is there anything in the DAN type treatments or the biomedical treatments? Is there anything that could really help treat those problems with speech and language, those problems with uh, lack of social skills, those problems with repetitive stereotype movements? And I'll talk a little bit about that, but you might gather from what I've said already about some of the biomedical treatments that we don't know for sure, but maybe they're helping with some of the core symptoms. And then you can treat the symptoms that are associated with pharmacology, and I know that's a controversial area, and I'll kind of close with that, and we'll talk more about it. So Jim Adams wrote a really nice review paper on biomedical treatments that's on the Autism Research Institute website. It was just put up oh, about a month ago. And I don't know if you've ever visited ARI, but it's all word, one word, www.autismresearchinstitute.org. And they have surveys of different treatments, and, and parents respond, report how their children did. It's a rather biased report, because they're the parents that go to the ARI website. And you know, obviously, they have a particular interest or, 
openness or background, but they report what works. But Jim wrote a paper kind of reviewing these different treatments, these biomedical treatments, talking about the evidence for them working and when they might be considered. And I'd have to tell you, I have no trouble at all with the first page of this. When parents come in and talk to me about what might me try, I say, you know, tell me about your child's diet. How is your child doing with that diet? What are they eating? Have you thought about trying the casein gluten-free diet, especially if they have GI symptoms? Most parents, by the time they get to me, say, yeah, I tried it and it didn't make a lot of difference. But there are a few parents that I talk to that say, you know, it's the single best thing that we've done for our child. It's made a big difference in how our child does. So until we have a better way of identifying who's going to do well on the casein gluten-free diet and who isn't, it's worth a try. It's hard on families. Everybody in the family probably needs to try and be on a casein gluten-free diet because if you're hoping to hide the ice cream in the freezer where your kid isn't going to get it, it's, it's, a tough, it's a tough act, a tough one to go on. Or you hope that you can save those munchies hidden someplace that have all the wheat and the other things in it and, and that you can keep them from your child. It's usually better if you can kind of everybody go on that diet and give it a try, but it's a challenge. Then you can say, what about vitamin and mineral supplements? Again, Jim Adams did a, an interesting paper, not a big paper and not published in a major journal, but still peer-reviewed, that talked about some benefit from vitamin and mineral supplements. And you can think about your favorite lab to go to. There are a number of them that have good products. I think Kirkman has good products in Oregon. But there are a whole variety of other places that do as well. And then you can think about essential fatty acids, especially if that's an area that you kind of like. You say, I want to try more natural treatments. I want to try to not go, I want to try everything. And so there's one good double-blind study of omega-3 showing that it's a benefit to children with autism. No harm in trying omega-3s. Some give some people the burpees and you burp up that fish oil and some kids really don't like taking it. But it now comes in a, in a custard or a, which in the study that we're doing will be in this little custard kind of way of delivering it. There are a variety of other ways that it might be considered, and maybe it makes a difference. Seems to reduce inflammation. Seems to maybe decrease irritability. Then I start having a little more trouble <coughs> as one thinks about this next page, which are, are gut treatments. What about using antifungals? There are people that talk about you know, statin and that whole family that may be of some benefit to kids. Not good studies that indicate that wiping out the, uh, the fungal kind of flora in your GI tract, uh, the candida and others, that, that this is a big problem. But there's some evidence of it, and some people have told me it's made a big difference for their children. Probiotics, I don't have any trouble with that. You know, everybody could take probiotics. So you have an upset stomach, you take that friendly bacteria. Those friendly bacteria come into your gut, and they help get rid of those unfriendly bacteria and help with an overgrowth of, of those friendly kinds of things. You can buy probiotics at the health food store. You can get it in yogurt. There are a variety of ways that that can help, especially children that have GI symptoms. We're not, one might also think about digestive enzymes that you can get from a variety of those nutritional houses that might make some difference for GI symptoms in some kids. I'm not suggesting any of that's a substitute for seeing a gastroenterologist and considering whatever they might suggest as ways that can help GI symptoms. But helping GI symptoms makes a big difference for children with autism. And the research that Tim Bowie has been doing at Harvard has suggested that you know finding lactose intolerance, finding a variety of other things, and treating it in a variety of ways is very helpful. And unfortunately, as many, I think Tim's seen 3,000 patients. He's a great teacher, if you've ever heard him talk. He really knows what he's talking about, but he just can't seem to write papers. So he doesn't publish these things in a way that it gets into the mainstream. But when you listen to him, you think, here's a gastroenterologist that seems really to kind of be open to these new ideas, but he's thinking about new things, and he's thinking about it in a good science way. One might then wonder about amino acids, uh, thyroid supplements, sulfation. I don't find any evidence for that, and I'm a little hesitant to, tr to try them. But you'll find Jim Adams in his review talks about some of the benefits of those. Glutathione, you know, a lot of sports people are taking glutathione. They wear it in a patch. They do it in a variety of other ways. It seems to help the body handle oxidative stress. We haven't started a study of that, although I did talk to some guy that manufactured the patch about saying you want to do a study. You furnish the patch, we'll furnish the patients. It hasn't happened yet, but we are doing the methyl B12 study. Chelation, 
You know, that's a tough one. I, um, we're not doing it here. I don't necessarily recommend it to people. If somebody says, I want to try it, I say, go see a good person that really knows what they're doing with the kind of metals that are being pulled out in addition to whether you think you're pulling out the mercury or not. There's actually been a study published recently that suggests the chelator contains uh, mercury in it. So when you look like you're getting mercury out, maybe you're getting the mercury from a chelator. I've had some parents tell me that it works very well for them. I, I met a pediatric neurologist, well-trained guy from, from Johns Hopkins, has a daughter with autism. I said, what treatments have you tried? And I ran through every one of these, and he tried every single one of them. I said, have you tried chelation with your daughter? He said, yeah, my daughter's not getting better, and I've got to feel that I've tried everything that I possibly can to help her. It didn't help, but I felt like I at least tried it. And I think that's the dilemma that I think parents face. Do I try this unproven treatment? There was a double-blind study going on at NIMH. I understand that's been stopped for a variety of reasons without being completed. Jim Adams was doing a double-blind study. It wasn't a perfect study, but he tells me that he'll be publishing that soon. So hopefully there'll be some evidence for us to judge about that. And then thinking about immune system regulation. IVIG, that's a pretty powerful, strong, expensive, immune-compromising kind of treatment. So one has to be careful about using that. But what if Actos work? Or Jackie McCandless talks a lot about low-dose naltrexone. I haven't had great results with that. No harm in trying it, I guess. She thinks that it, it, it offers some benefit. But again, another treatment that might work on the immune system. If you're thinking about looking at the target symptoms, and I'm about finished, one might think about additional symptoms that we see in our kids with autism, like distractible inattention, or difficulty shifting sets in attention that's more like the impulsivity, compulsivity part of what they do. They get stuck. Affective instability, they have meltdowns, ups and downs, meltdowns that can go on for a half an hour or an hour or four hours. Cognitive disorganization, they get kind of so overwhelmed at times that they just come unglued and they don't make very good sense. Uh, even if they don't have language, you feel like they're just coming unglued. And anxiety and hyperarousal, where these kids get so stimulated by bright lights or loud noises or other things that they're right on the edge and it doesn't take much to push them over the top. So there are some strategies that one can think about with medications. And one needs to do them thoughtfully, but in weigh the risks and benefits. But stimulants can help with that distractible inattention. About 20% of children with autism tend to benefit from stimulant medications. But a lot of kids tend to come totally unglued on stimulants, seem almost psychotic, seem to be coming off the wall, not a good treatment. Wish we could predict better who might have that problem to begin with, but there are that 20% that do well. It might also include Stratera. Some people have found Stratera used for treating ADHD might be a little less activating or a little kinder to kids with autism. I've treated a several families here. Um, I, I shouldn't mention this story, but I will just for a second to digress that we have parents that come in and say, why don't you do more research on this? Or why don't you do more research on that? So one family came in treated the, their ADHD, and they said, why don't you do more research in ADHD? And I said, well, you know, if you'd help fund us, we'd be pleased to do that. So that, that man gave us $50,000 to study ADHD. Another family came in to see us, and came in to see me, was referred from somebody in Southern California. Child had autism and had ADHD, and it had a bad reaction to stimulants. I said, well, let's try atomoxetine. The child did great, really quite well, and the family said, why don't you do more research on atomoxetine and ADHD? And I said, well, you know, if you'd help fund us, we would. That family gave us $100,000. And so we're, <coughs> Blythe Corbett has been doing those studies, and we're looking more to try and see if we can understand something more about an anterior and posterior attentional system that would help us know more what might help. I've got one real capper story about somebody else who asked, but I'll tell you that one later, about, uh, about how much they decided to help. Um, but these are all the different treatments. Antidepressants, a variety of symptoms that can help with impulsivity, compulsivity. SSRIs seem to be helpful, but also seem to be activating. Atypical neuroleptics, and I can go through this fast. If, if this is what interests you, I'd be happy to talk more about it. But I'm trying to just not give it more time than I give 
biomedical or the other kinds of treatments as well, but I'd be happy to talk more about these. And you do have them in your handouts. Different atypicals that help with social awkwardness, inappropriateness, this kind of cognitive disorganization, the coming unglued. Mood stabilizers. There have been a few studies showing mood stabilizers might help with autism. My experience is they're not great, but I have some children that are doing very well on some of the mood stabilizers that have a lot of meltdowns that seem almost like they have a little touch of bipolar disorder with their autism. And adrenergic stimulating agents like clonidine and Tenex that help some of these kids that are just so quick to startle and to go over the edge easily and can also help children sleep at night in a relatively safe way. We're thinking about new studies here at the Mind Institute. Nemenda is a medication that's used to treat Alzheimer's disease. Works on glutamate receptors. Michael Ches plus two other researchers have published studies showing Nemenda seems to make a difference. Michael, if you've talked to him, and, and as I say, he's here in town now, does talk a lot about how much he finds Nemenda to be helpful in kids. I haven't found as big a, a, an effect and I find a number of parents have a great deal of trouble with their prescription plan who says Nemenda is for Alzheimer's disease and your kid has Alzheimer's. He's the wrong age and he's got the wrong disorder. And so some companies have refused to pay for it. But the company that makes Nemenda is, is working with the FDA to develop a double-blind placebo-controlled trial, one with children, one with adults, to look at this. We have an ongoing double-blind placebo-controlled trial of Abilify. That's an atypical neuroleptic going on right now that you know offers f uh, uh, free treatment. I guess people have to spend the time coming in, but they get a very thorough workup and they get an evaluation, primarily for children with autism and a great deal of irritability or aggression. We um, are working on this double-blind trial with Actos. We're working on this trial with HBOT. We're working on the atomoxetine and attention deficit. We have an omega-3 study being reviewed right now. We're looking at carifolin, a medication or a, a nutrient that combines uh, B12 and methylfolate along with NAC. That's a, a kind of nutritional supplement used again for Alzheimer's that seems promising, and we're looking to carry on more of that. Rondi Hagerman, who's well known to many of you for the work that she does in Fragile X also has a great interest in autism and is one of those out-of-the-box thinkers, too, that's always looking for something new. She has several new treatments that she's looking at that might be helpful for Fragile X or might be helpful for Fragile X and autism together. And she has a large grant being considered to really even develop this translational model even further. We're trying to look through the Autism Phenome Project at a number of interventions, including different ways of evaluating that might be helpful. Could it really be helpful to measure metals and persistent organics and pesticides on a routine basis? Could it really be helpful to do routine MRIs and MRI evaluations on children when they first come in? We don't do them routinely now, and no regular kinds of recommendations would suggest that they're helpful, but perhaps particularly well-suited uh, or specialized kinds of studies could make a difference. At the Mind Institute, we kind of have a timeline for where we're going and where we want to do these things. We've been working at the phenotyping project, trying to phenotype children who have autism to better subtype them and know where they're going. But we're trying to run that right into this translational research. So these studies that we do are being done in these well-characterized children so that we could go back with those children that either did very well or those that didn't so that we could know better what treatments work for which children. So as you know, the Mind Institute was started in 98. We've moved into our new building in 2003. We're expanding our collaborations. We've filled our building. We're at the point we, now where we have over 250 people here doing research. And every study carol, every little space is filled. And we're saying what we want to do now is have a translational research building right there where our basic science and our clinical science could work together to develop new treatments. And someday, we hope a laboratory school back there. Those steps for our translational research program include directing a, uh, or developing our translational research work group, which is going on now, recruiting a director of translational research, developing a program of translational research projects, and then getting our building completed. 
Many of you have seen the paintings throughout our buildings and artwork. There's over 80 of them around. One of my favorites is this one called The Haircut. <laughs> if you, um, this is available right out in front of our clinic. And you can see how this little boy felt about getting a haircut. The bee is probably the buzz of a razor cutting his hair. You can see the scissors. But his mother said that he always put an escape route in all of his pictures. And you can see the little door over in the corner <laughs> as his escape route. And we hope that the Mind Institute is an escape route for children and families who have children with autism so that we can find a way out of this devastating disorder in ways that we can reverse the trend that seems to be growing right now and turn it back the other direction. You can learn more about our studies at our website, mindinstitute.org. I think you should have some information that's handed out here now that tells you about our studies as well. There are about 50 of them going on. We appreciate our community supporting us in those ways. And I'm going to thank you and say I'm open for questions. In the very back. Uh, how much is uh, stem cell research incorporated to uh, these studies? The question had to do, what about stem cell being incorporated into our studies? Well, you know, when the stem cell movement was really getting going, one of our founding fathers, Lou Vismara, kept saying to us, let's do something in stem cell. And David Amaral and I both said, we don't even know what causes autism yet. You know, it's hard to know where we can put a stem cell. But we've moved along, and we've just recruited a new researcher a person that works at the molecular level, considered in a sense a stem cell researcher as one of our very last recruits who's going to move into our new, or into our wet lab building. His name is Stephen Nocter, and he's joining us this summer in June. And we're really pleased that he's somebody working at the most basic level of neuron and cell development to help us really understand more what we can do at that very basic level. There are some studies wondering whether stem cells might be regrown in certain ways that could make a difference. And some research even suggesting maybe HBOT does that. So we're interested in learning more about ways that we might regenerate areas of the brain. But unfortunately, we haven't found any one area of the brain that we say we could hold this responsible for us to, to make interventions. But we're thinking about it. Yes. Me? OK. Uh, I know a lot of parents here have a lot of more reading than I do, but I, I don't know what's oxidative stress. Okay. So if you could explain what it is. Well, I don't know that I can explain oxidative stress as well as a, a biochemist could, but oxidative stress comes when different things from our environment, toxins, stressors, other things like that, in a sense get detoxified by the body. And they do it by this little methyl group. The, the methyl attaches, and it somehow then helps rid the body of this toxin, removes it. But in the process, the methyl group comes off of the B12 and the folic acid. And what happens then is it gets re-picked back up by diet, the things in our diet, and a variety of other things. So, when people talk about taking antioxidants, they're in some ways trying to improve that process, the way that our body ages, the way that the body works and, and handles stress. And it's thought that perhaps that could have a role in at least some children who develop autism. We're kind of new as a family in dealing with autism. And so the first thing they said was the Mind Institute is a wonderful place to start, which I totally believe and I'm like, we're just like so gun ho to do this for you know, my grandson. but. When I call, it's like, the list is long. And so then I became very discouraged. But I'm not now, because you know, he's still going to get in here. But I'm like, what do, we, what do we do to try to help him? I mean, is the research that you have here available to other places, or is this just your research? And how do we even benefit from what you have if we cannot get him into your program? Well, that, that's a good question. I don't know if everybody heard it. I was afraid there was going to be applause afterwards because I, I, I think that uh, you know one of the, the hardest things, and I should have started off the talk with that. I think when the Mind Institute was first founded, people really hoped that it would be a major res a treatment resource for this whole region and that people could come here for full service treatment um, and, and help their children get the very latest and the very best kinds of treatments. As we started doing that, we found that we were getting such huge waiting lists and had so many people that were coming 
and we weren't able to do our research or we were distracted from that. So we made a tough decision, which was to say we're a research institute and we're primarily focused on trying to find the causes and cures and better treatment for autism. So we have these over 50 studies that we love to have people come and participate in and you can read about them on our website and you can talk to Meredith who's listed up there about studies that might fit for your children and your grandchildren and many of you here have participated in those studies and you get some written feedback, you get a careful evaluation, you get a, a number of things that may or may not be useful to you right now but there are certain benchmarks that we have and keep. We also do all that we can to disseminate our information into the community. So Dr. Brown mentioned our summer institute that <clears throat> comes in, in August and parents are welcome at that, educators, other practitioners. And we're always open to having other practitioners come and try and learn from us about what they can do in their community. And I get lots of emails and lots of comments from other people out in the communities that are saying, what would you do about this or what do you think about that? We're happy to do those things as well, but we're not a full service treatment program and, and we feel in a sense we'd be doing somebody a disservice to take them in pretending that we are. We'd rather work with our regional centers and work with our local providers and others to try and help them to provide the good care. We also have several uh, telehealth grants being reviewed right now that we hope will allow us to hook up to places, to doctor's offices, to schools that would help us disseminate the information. And I know that sounds um, like a cop-out a little bit. Uh, what you want is to bring your child here and have him, that right. And, uh, and we would hope that for the studies that we can do that. And I do psychopharm consults, but only psychopharm and follow-up for those kids that fit into that area. Yes. And if a parent of an autistic child called the Mind Institute and said they'd tried everything and they now wanted to try chelation, can the Mind Institute make a suggestion for somebody who seems good if the parent was sort of trying to force you to? <laughs> well, I don't think the Mind Institute would make that recommendation because in a sense it would make us liable in the same way. But if you came to our environmental toxicology conference that we had in November, there was a practitioner here doing that, John Green from Oregon. I don't recommend him from the Mind Institute point of view, but I think very highly of him. I mean, because we can't necessarily say that, but I, I think there are, some, there are some people that are good, and, and you heard about the little boy that died, and because he got the wrong kind of uh, chelator, um, it wasn't that the chelation was bad, but they used the wrong kind. And so I do think it's important to go see somebody that knows what they're doing, and, that doctor is somebody that I respect. Yes. Yes. Um, we participated in the Kiarta study, and you had mentioned a few uh, findings from the Kiarta study. Is it possible to find specifically what my particular findings were? Robin? <laughs> Did you hear the question? I heard the question. Um, I I don't don't know. I'm happy to touch base with you after. We've, we have a little trouble releasing research findings because they are indeed research findings. They're not things that we can back up as a full clinical finding, like if you went and had your MRI done at the MRI center, it would be read by a radiologist and that would be a bona fide report. When we do studies that maybe we don't fully know what the norms are or where we don't fully know um, uh, how to interpret those results because they're research findings, we are cautious about sharing them because we don't want them to be taken out of context. But, but you might talk to Robin afterwards, to Dr. Hansen afterwards. Yes. I heard you talk about myelination. Um, my daughter was diagnosed with a 10 month delay in myelination. Are they related or are they, did I hear you say they are related or they are not? Well, it's a, been interesting to think about what role myelin might play, and Martha Herbert is somebody that's published a fair amount about myelin, abnormal myelination in autism. And uh, so I think that people are more and more accepting that perhaps abnormal myelination might be involved in at least some cases of autism. It's not totally clear what that means. I mean, if you, how you would, di you could diagnose it from an MRI, there are ways that you segment the white matter from the gray matter. It's not clear what we do about an intervention, but it's at least a step towards saying we know something about an abnormality that might lead us to an intervention. 
Yes. Is uh, there any help for uh, young adults who, uh, yes. in their infancy, uh, this whole scheme of things was too new to even benefit them with diagnosis, you see? And so the early diagnosis was out of the question. And uh, as a young adult, they still have behavioral problems, uh, social adaptivity problems. Well, I think that's a great question, and I wish that we had better programs for adults. I think those programs are growing, and I think people are increasingly thinking about what might be done. Um, those, sometimes those medications can be helpful if they have those severe symptoms. So I'm a little more inclined to go for those biomedical treatments in younger children and a little more inclined to try and treat the associated symptoms in, in people that are a bit older. We do find social skills groups make a big difference, and we do have an ongoing adult social skill group here led by Susan Balkerman in the back of the room um, that can help these, these young people learn better. Um, Bernie uh, Remlin, who used to be a great advocate for, meth for uh, vitamin B6 and magnesium, used to say that he thought it worked better with adults who had autism than in children. I don't know whether that's true or not. The concern in taking too much of B6 is that you can get a neuropathy and get numbness in your fingers and hands. So for all of these things, it's important that you take a good dose of them. Vitamin A is one that's not a, a water-soluble vitamin and can cause um, uh, ascites and liver toxicity and something that one needs to watch carefully for. But perhaps some of these vitamin supplements, at least for, from Bernie, could make a difference in adults. But I'd have to say that for the most part, the further you get away from that initial insult, whatever it is, the harder it is to do things that are other than trying to back up a little bit with better social skills, better job training. Vocational rehabilitation programs are starting to try and do a lot to help people learn good social skills. And I think that our parent activists are doing a huge amount now in saying, you know, our children are aging. They're getting to be adolescents. They're getting to be young adults. We need to find something to do to help these people. And I think those programs are increasingly effective, but I don't have one clear source to have you talk to, but it, Susan's in the red sweater in the back, and I would talk to her. <laughs> yes? You know, just based on what I've heard, this is the first time I've been here, so I wasn't in the last one. But just based on what you're saying, it seems to me what you're saying is that something happened to affect his brain. My great-grandson had a traumatic, um, the mother had a traumatic pre pregnancy to the point that the baby had bowel movements mm -hmm. within her. So it seems that he may have been a candidate from the beginning, or he may have, that may have been a clue that he could have been autistic because of the stress that he was in that caused him to do that. And then we kept taking him to the doctor because he didn't have social skills, he seemed to not hear, you know, just all those other things, and they were testing him for everything, but they didn't consider autism. And I don't understand, and we're right here where the Mayan Institute is, why he wasn't considered. Well, I think it's, uh, I, I don't know how to defend that. I, I think that uh, pediatricians at times, um, you know, you were talking about the, the child being meconium, having meconium, uh, um, in the amniotic fluid, which many, many children have without getting autism. So it's not necessarily that all those signs led to say, well, this is a child that's at risk. And there's not any indication that meconium staining is a sure sign of autism either, or is a, is a marker. So I think pediatricians are learning a lot more, and I think some of these early intervention studies, that are early identification studies, are helping them know what to look for. But I think many times they've overlooked it too, and I know that parents feel so tragic when they feel like, gosh, maybe we missed this important window of opportunity that we could have made an intervention. I never think it's too late, and I think that, you know, while you may f feel your f if someone's 50-year-old son, um, you know, could still show some great benefit and could move in a positive direction, uh, the brain does continue to have some plasticity, but the earlier the better, and, and I'm sorry your great-grandson was missed. Yes. Yes. I was wondering how uh, young can you notice uh, the symptoms of autism and what would be the early signs? Well, the earliest symptoms of autism, people had thought maybe they could identify even before a year of age. And at least my understanding, I don't know if 
Sally Rogers or Sally Ozen off is here. They're the real experts that we have in, or anyone from their group. But they thought that maybe they were identifying symptoms even before a year of age, but they found they weren't um, always predictive. So it may be raising a red flag before the time to happen would be. Although a lot of these kids that showed early markers may then have still come out somewhere on a spectrum of developmental disability that would suggest early intervention when one sees that even early is worth doing. I think the, the earliest that people now are saying with any great confidence that they can do it is about 18 months, maybe 12, but usually 18. So, so a child that uh, shows uh, symptoms of not uh, cuddling with their mother and posturing away, and that's not a sign? Well, it would be a sign certainly for a, good, for a good evaluation. It could be a number of things, and I think that's when it's important to try and find a good, knowledgeable pediatrician that doesn't say, oh, it's nothing. And I think those kinds of things that came from the studies that I'd mentioned earlier that Sally uh, Ozanoff and Sally Rogers have been doing about not responding to a name, different kinds of gaze aversion, or not looking at the, <coughs> um, as much at the eyes, maybe more at the mouth. Some people have wondered, is that auditory cortex? They can't hear the words as well, so they're having to look more at the mouth. Those kinds of symptoms that are of concern. I think increasingly pediatricians are being sensitized, but we have some very good kind of measures and screening instruments that could be used at that early age that could help one know whether more of an evaluation is worth doing. Yes. Yep, you. <laughs> you. Has there been Discussion or consideration around environmental toxins such as metals and PCBs in breast milk, in mom's breast milk. Uh, recommendation up to a year of benefits, but not going beyond that. John Green has done some studies on that. Just wondering if that has been. Yeah, I don't, Dr. Hansen, do you have an answer to that? I didn't actually, but it was about um, environmental toxins from breast milk, PCBs, metals from mom. One of our study coordinators just last week did a, a, a kind of PubMed search on uh, breastfeeding and autism and found there weren't many studies of it, but there was one that actually indicated um, improved outcome with breastfeeding, that it seemed to enhance the child's immune system and help them better withstand whatever toxins might be there. But there has been an interest, the reason that we thought about it was somebody had suggested that perhaps some of the lipids that might be toxic are lipids that are found in the breast and perhaps heavy metals as well. And so we searched the literature to see what was available and, and that's what we found. So I don't think there's a strong evidence, although I've heard people raise it. I think the odds would be better that breastfeeding would be better than not breastfeeding. Yes? Could, could the Mind Institute develop a list of literature for general pediatricians that are considering going into autism. Yes. Dr. Hansen, we keep getting these good questions for you. The question had to do the question had to do with what about would the Mind Institute be able to develop a list of materials for pediatricians that might be working or evaluating children with autism. Dr. Hansen is the head of a along with Dr. Hageman, but but uh, Robin is the big head of our USED program, and uh, it's a universe. It's a educational program meant for pediatricians and others. And I'll bet she's probably working on something like that. You know, so we don't necessarily have a list that we hand out to pediatricians, but we do a lot of training trying to help pediatricians understand early diagnosis, um, evaluation, and 
we try and help them understand how to help parents make decisions by looking at whatever evidence there is and, and actually helping to monitor potential side effects for parents who decide they want to try some biomedical treatment. So you know, we're trying to support both families and physicians as they're both trying to help make good decisions for children in a safe way. In regards to your mental B12 injections, when you did the study on that, yes. did you put like parents' comments or results to what they saw on like, the yes, websites we or any videos? Well, or we don't do on the websites. We do include them and gather them and write them down and we'll analyze those in the end about what they found. The person who does a lot of that is Jim Newbrander and you can see the video. Okay, yep. so he does a lot of that there, but we haven't put those on our websites per se. Over at the door. Uh, I saw on your third slide that you had listed DIR four time as an evidence-based intervention strategy. Um, I was wondering if you could cite your source because I would love to have my hands on it being in a district that's moving away from that model. Well, I think that evidence is probably uh, overusing the term. I think that Stanley Greenspan has certainly published lots of books on Floritam. But in terms of saying that he actually um, uh, has done studies or a kind of comparative study, I'm not aware of any that showed DIR floor time doing that. There is a center in um, Pasadena that I was just at last week that does exclusively DIR floor time. And I think, th yeah, and I think they are doing some studies of that, but I, I don't know of anything that's been published that shows that it works. So evidence-based doesn't necessarily mean that it stands up to scientific scrutiny. That's right, and I probably should have moved that more into the anecdotal-based uh, kind of treatments. But, uh, but I thought that, in a sense, I put it there because there is so much written and so much well-reasoned, and because I really like Stanley. And, uh, and, and uh, so. Uh, um, two questions. One, is the Mind Institute able to provide a list of pediatricians who have a specialty with autism or work with autism? And second, I have the, um, the research studies that are going on and are, are they constantly accepting new subjects or are they closed? The first question, do we provide a list of pediatricians that we think work with autism? You know, we've had a hard time, uh, and, and I know a number of people have asked us about this, about providing, you know, uh, endorsements in a sense of people that might be doing those things well. And we've hesitated to do that because it implies an endorsement. I think off the record, if you talk to pediatricians like Dr. Hansen or Dr. Hagerman or others, I think they can recommend people that, um, that they th have worked with or they think is pretty good. And the same with me if somebody says, what about a child psychiatrist or a psychologist? But we've been hesitant, feeling that if we put it on a website or gave that to people, that it's implying a certain kind of an endorsement. So we haven't done that. The studies, some we try and keep our studies up to date. But I have to tell you that there are some of them that are up there that have been closed and, and are no longer going on. But Meredith works hard at trying to be sure that she takes studies down once they've closed and are lo no longer there. And there may be studies that are going up that aren't up there either. So if you wonder and want to talk to Meredith, um, she's pleasant to talk to. It's on the website as well. You can search by diagnosis, age of your child, and, and then you see which ones are open. You can enroll in the study online. So. Yeah. Yes. Um, are you aware of any studies where they study the single umbilical or, um, artery? and its relationship maybe to autism or developmental disorder or auditory processing disorder? Because there is the indicator, so you do have more time with your doctor. But then afterwards, they're like, well, you, did, you, know, you didn't have Down syndrome, so you're good. And then my son has developmental issues now, and I, of my pregnancy, that was the anomaly. And then once he was cleared for the other kinds of things, it, wasn't, it, it was never mentioned again. Abnormalities of the umbilical artery? Yeah, a single umbilical artery. So you have one in and one out instead of one in and two out. I don't know of any, anybody here? That I, I don't know of any, any studies. Um, doesn't mean they don't exist. You might go to PubMed. You ever use PubMed and search there? Just enter that and put it along with autism and, 
That's usually a good way to see if anything shows up. I'm going to take one more question. And then I know you, we said we were going to stop at 7.30. I'm amazed you all have stayed here with me for so long. But yes. You used the term recovery, and it, it prompted me to think that I'm not so sure that uh, the gift of Asperger's is something that should be recovered. Um, maybe society needs to recover it. I'm not sure. what is there a policy with respect to that? I, I consider it a gift, and it's a remarkable gift. And, Parts of it I would like to have recovered, but there's so much of it that I go, whoa, I would never want to get Well, you know, I know that's a real controversial area about talking about recovery. And I think it's important to think of it in terms of uh, a spectrum disorder. If you talk to a parent who has a very severely affected child with autism, um, who has no language and is going around flapping and, you know, just hasn't made any progress and you feel like they're just in pain and they're not having any fun, it's hard to say you know, that's a gift to this child and that they ought to have it. But I, I do respect um, the neurodiversity group and, and the things that they say and the way that they at least argue for saying that there are people at some places on the spectrum that, you know, we ought to be able to say those are, you know, we're just all folks and everybody's got something and, and uh, that's good and something that may not be. And, and so when it seems pejorative or negative or this is a disorder to take away, then, then I think that's not the kind of humaneness that we ought to have. Thank you all for being here. <laughs>